on today's episode, we'll be delving into the biggest cash robbery in UK history. Over £53 million was stolen, of which £32 million has still never been recovered. This is the 2006 Securitas Depot robbery. On February 21st, 2006, Colin Dixon was on the A249 near Stockbury, driving towards his Herne Bay home. As the manager of the Securitas Cash Management Depot in Vale Road, Tunbridge, he regularly took this route back home in his silver Nissan Almira. However, this night would change everything for Mr. Dixon and his family. Pulled over by two men who appeared to be undercover police officers, he was put into the back of a Vauxhall Vectra and told he had committed a number of speeding offences. But things were not adding up. Radio 1 was blaring out of the car stereo, and as the driver screeched off back in the direction of Tunbridge, Mr. Dixon suddenly suspected something was wrong. Wearing a prosthetic mask to obscure his identity, one of the gang members turned around to Mr. Dixon and said, Your guess we're not policemen. Don't do anything silly and nobody will be hurt. Mr. Dixon was driven west on the M20 motorway to the West Morning Bypass, where he was tied up and transferred into a white van, which then took him to a remote farm in Staplehurst. It was at this remote location that Mr. Dixon was interrogated, as the two gang members tried to learn everything they could about the makeup of the cash depot. At this point in time, the pair of robbers were filling in any gaps of knowledge from which they'd already obtained from another member of the gang, who had recently bagged a job on the site and had secretly been filming video inside and already shown it to the group. Meanwhile, whilst Mr. Dixon was being interrogated at the remote location in Staplehurst, Mrs. Dixon was growing anxious that her husband had not yet returned home. Despite the fact Mr. Dixon had been working at the depot for the last seven years, she'd never forgotten about the risks of the job. That evening, the doorbell rang and Mrs. Dixon opened the door to two men, apparently policemen, who said her husband had been involved in a car accident. The pair offered to take Mrs. Dixon and her child to see him, but as they got into the back of the Volvo, they knew something was wrong. Mrs. Dixon screamed for help, but one of the robbers had put a gloved hand over her face, and Mr. Dixon's child began to cry. Later on, Mrs. Dixon and her child had arrived at the farm at which Mr. Dixon was being interrogated at. However, they were left alone, shaking and terrified, in the back of a red van with a Parcel Force logo fixed on to the side. The kidnappers revealed to Mr. Dixon the lengths which they had taken to successfully pull off the heist. They pulled off the tape, covering his eyes and revealing they had his family captured too. With everything set, three vehicles inside, including a 7.5 tonne van, they drove off in a convoy with the Dixons inside and they headed to the Tunbridge depot. Upon arriving at the Securitas depot and being let in by Mr. Dixon, a member of the gang forced staff at gunpoint to open the gates to admit the van and other vehicles. The gang members' faces were hidden by balaclavas and they were armed with handguns, shotguns, AK-47 assault rifles and a Scorpion submachine gun. The sudden commotion had led some of the workers to believe this was an unorthodox training exercise. However, Mr. Dixon gravely told one of them, just do whatever the bloke says. The 14 employees who were inside carrying out their night shift and Dixon's family were tied up and locked in cash cages. All the while, the gang began loading bundles of the Bank of England notes into the back of the Renault lorry they would backed up into the loading bay. By 2.34am, the 7.5 tonne Renault lorry had screeched away from the depot with £52,996,760 in cash, but they left behind £153,833,020.73 that they were unable to fit into the vehicle. The employees and Dixon's family were only able to escape the cash cages they were trapped in after Mr. Dixon's child managed to squeeze through the bars of the cage and free them all. 45 minutes later, Mr. Dixon sounded the alarm. He had delayed this in case the robbers planned on returning. The story hit front pages and news channels across the world as the events of the heist came to light. Then Kent Police Chief Constable Mike Fuller assigned 100 officers to the case and they began to use every method at their disposal to track down the callous thieves who had seemingly disappeared into the night. The following day, Securitas 
and their insurers offered a reward of £2 million for any information about the heist. On the same day, the red van with the Parcel Force logo attached to the side, linked to the abduction of the Dixons, was found at the Hook and Hatchet pub in Hucking. As well as this, two cars that were believed to be used in the heist as disguised undercover police vehicles were found in Leeds, and Mr Dixon's Nissan was discovered at the Cock Horse pub in Detling. The next day, Friday the 24th of February, metal cages thought to have been used to transport the money were recovered in a field near Detling. A white transit van containing 1.3 million pounds, guns, body armour and balaclavas was found in the car park of the Ashford International Hotel following a tip-off from a member of the public. Also, a hoard of £8 million was found in a lockup in Southborough. Slowly, the findings began to reveal a strange paradox at the heart of one of the biggest cash thefts in world history. In some respects, the criminals have gone to a great extent to plan the heist. Hollywood quality prosthetic masks to hide their identity, making sure they had a man working on the inside, kidnapping Mr. Dixon miles from his home, and having multiple vehicle switches prepared. However, the mistakes they made ultimately enabled investigators to unpick the case. Some vehicles were registered straight back to addresses linked to the criminals, and others used their personal phones to communicate rather than burners. By early March that year, Kent Police had recovered nearly 20 million pounds, and by the summer, said they'd made 30 arrests over the course of the investigation, which by the end of the year would have cost £6 million. The preliminary trial began on 26th of June 2007 at the Old Bailey in London. The Crown Prosecution Service initially charged seven others in connection with the robbery, but they were all acquitted in court. On the 28th of January 2008, the jury returned guilty verdicts on Stuart Royal, Jetmere Book Papa, Roger Kautz, Leah Russia, and Emir Hissanaj. Leah Russia, then 35, of Lambersart Close, Southborough, was linked to two locations where almost £10 million was discovered. During the trial, the court heard how millions of pounds was discovered in 18 holdalls at a lockup near the home of Russia. The garage in Castle Street, Southborough, near Tunbridge Wells, was just a short distance from Russia's house. Disguises and plans were also found at his home which confirmed his central part in the robbery. He was given an indefinite sentence and will serve a minimum of 15 years. Then 59 of Allen Street Maidstone, the court heard that Stuart Royal was probably one of the robbers and potentially one of the group who kidnapped the Dixons. The former car salesman received an indefinite sentence to serve a minimum of 15 years and another six years were added in 2012 after he failed to comply with a two million pound confiscation order. Then 30 of South London, Roger Coutts had strong links to Lee Murray, another of the criminals, and was linked to locations where more than £18 million was found. His DNA was also found on the cable ties used to bind staff members of the depot. The garage owner was given an indefinite sentence to serve a minimum of 15 years. Then aged 28 and from East Sussex, Amir Hissanaj was the inside man of the group. Securing a job at the Securitas depot prior to the robbery, he filmed inside the building using a high-tech video camera the size of a 50p coin which he fixed to his belt. The information he obtained was crucial in the gang carrying out the raid. For his efforts, he netted himself a 20-year jail term. Nicknamed High Biz by police because of the bright fluorescent tabard he allegedly wore on the night of the heist, the then 26-year-old Jet Book Papa of Hadlow Road near the depot was linked to a £1.4 million stash of the raid money. The jury were told that Papa was given the role of guarding Mr. Dixon's wife and child before and during the robbery. After appealing his sentence, his 15-year indeterminate sentence was replaced with a 30-year term. Lee Lightning Murray was making a name for himself as a mixed martial arts fighter prior to his name being forever tied to the Tunbridge heist. However, his fighting career was abruptly ended in 2005 after being stabbed in a brawl at the birthday party of model Lauren Pope. Just five months after nearly dying from the multiple stab wounds, he is believed to have masterminded the robbery operation himself. Lee Murray fled to Morocco shortly after the heist and brought a mansion worth almost £1 million, but was arrested in 2010 and jailed in the country for 25 years. 
Then 28 from Chatham, Paul Allen fled to Morocco along with Lee Murray after the event in February 2006, but was extradited back to the UK and handed an 18-year sentence. Paul Allen was given the nickname The Enforcer for his part in the robbery and was released in 2015 after serving six years and free on remand, qualifying him for release on licence. On July the 11th, 2019, he was rushed to hospital and placed on life support after being shot in the neck. Six shots were fired at a house in Woodford Green, East London, that Alan had been renting from comedian Russell Kane. Next up, in 2010, Ian Bowram, the then 47-year-old from Devon, was jailed for three years and nine months after almost £1 million was found in the boot of his car, four months after the robbery. £380,000 of it was in £50 notes and linked to the securities heist. Byram also had convictions from the mid-1990s for a type of VAT fraud called Missing Trader Intracommunity Fraud. Police believed he was using this technique to launder some of the Tunbridge money. However, there is one man the police are still trying to track down. Amateur boxing coach Sean Lupton of Hearn Bay is still at large and believed to be hiding in northern Cyprus after vanishing while on bail. The Mediterranean country has no extradition treaty with the UK, but the president previously assured the UK government if Lupton, now in his early 60s, is caught, then he will be deported. His ex-wife, Therese, made a 4,000 mile round trip in 2013 in an attempt to find him but she never managed to track him down. In 2017, his son Jordan died in a jet ski accident in Herne Bay. As for the Dixons, they were given new identities, moving to Australia to begin afresh and try to forget the nightmare, which undoubtedly changed their lives. After the night of the securities raid, 21 million pounds of the Bank of England cash was recovered relatively quickly. But in the years since then, just £50,000 of the still missing £32 million has been successfully traced. So, what exactly happened to all that missing cash? Robert Green, OBE, is the former Head of Science and Technology for the Police and Crime Standards Directorate. The lifelong forensic specialist st stated the power of tracking cash in criminal cases has previously been proven with serial killer Peter Sutcliffe, known colloquially as the Yorkshire Ripper. Sutcliffe's crimes were traced back to him, partially by a five pound note he left on the body of Jean Jordan, who he murdered and left in a Manchester allotment on October the 1st, 1977. In relation to the 2006 securities heist, according to Robert Green, there are several possible outcomes of the missing 32 million pounds. It could be carefully hidden away somewhere, not being touched. Alternatively, it could have been meticulously laundered over a number of years, which would have undoubtedly required a carefully planned wide-scale operation. Mr. Green, however, struggles to believe that the gang were capable of disappearing the amount of money stolen. After all, they did get caught. Another possibility is that the cash was whisked away to a country with bank secrecy laws, making it nigh on impossible to recover. In terms of where the case currently stands, Kent Police claimed this year that the search for the missing money has hit a dead end. Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Fotheringham, head of major crime at the Kent and Essex Serious Crime Directorate, announced in 2021, whilst the 2006 securities robbery is not currently a live investigation, it remains subject to regular review and we continue to appeal for anyone with information to come forward. In the 15 years since the crime was committed, we have made inquiries around the world to both identify those responsible and recover the outstanding cash that was taken and we will continue to act on any new evidence that may come to light in the future. Seven people were convicted for their roles in the kidnap and robbery and around £20 million of the stolen money has been recovered to date. In the time that has passed since the incident, it is clear that a large amount of the remaining money is now untraceable, although we are continuing to explore opportunities via the Proceeds of Crime Act to seize assets from those involved. As it stands, Firstly, we should be questioning, where is Sean Lupton, as he may possess crucial information to uncovering the robbery? Additionally, we should investigate what has happened to the £32 million that has still not been recovered from the robbery.